This is a conversation with Dries Long. Yeah, so I, I have a few topics that I've been um, really pondering. And, I, and to me, I'm, I'm trying to bring it together under the, under the... So it's still talent-oriented, but it's, I want to expand on the talent and make the container bigger. And I want to include two real... Uh, two, two things in it that we haven't talked about as much. So the first one is you, you often talk about talents as energy, na natural energy. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, I would love to know if in your own thinking, and I will ask this again in a moment, this natural energy is connected to life energy. And if there is such a thing as life force or life energy that we all have, how are talents connected to that? Because that's kind of the way I... I come to think about it and I experience it in myself that, um, that I, I have a more, and I visually, I would put it like that. I have a, I have a life force that actually wants to come into the world. And it, for me, the talents are kind of connected to this life force as different expressions of that. And that in the way I think of it, some of my talents are more closely connected with life force. So it's really much easier for my life force to, to nourish them, which is what, why they energize me. And some are really further away from my life force. So trying to nourish that, it takes a lot more work for me and actually it drains me more because it's not as close to this, sure. to this source. So that's kind of my visual representation. And I would love to talk about that. Okay. And as one example for that, and maybe as a, as a detour, because I know you have kids, um, I would love to know what your experience with talents and kids is. So if you would say people are born with talents, people are developing them in early childhood, uh, what's your perspective on that? Because I actually imagine that might, I find that interesting just for the bigger implications yes. that that has. Okay. So those are kind of the topics for me today. Don't oh. know how they how they sound for you. Sure, let's give it a go. Where do you want to start? Shall we start with? So for for me, I would actually love to know if the, if the term life force and life energy, if that is an, anything you ever think about or use in your own thinking, or if that's something that mm. eh, not that interesting to you. No. Um... It's, it's definitely something that that I do relate with. I think I think it's something that uh, must or I use very contextually within my coaching, et cetera, because in my experience, few people think in that direction um, or want to think in that direction. Um, <clears throat> and, and and also, I believe there's a lot of different vocabulary and concepts tied to it. Uh, some people may, may ring fence it in a mindset of religion um, and express it in terms of a creation or creator, even a god, etc. Um, and and each, each individual, I think, must tie it back to, to their reference um, mm -hmm. you think what you're referring to is a highly spiritual discussion not religious discussion mm -hmm. but spiritual discussion and that's something that i'm very drawn to and very interested and open towards because i believe we are spiritual beings um, we're not only beings in terms of physicality or emotions or cognitive function but also in spiritual function. And that's got a huge impact uh, on us. So when you refer to this in the words that you use of life force or life energy, uh, there's different terms that people can, can use it. I do believe that uh, it is this energy that I also refer to is experienced in different ways. The, 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 the most popular way that people identify with it is a physical energy. It is a motivation. 
it's a physical energy that they achieve that they can relate directly to the activity of their talents. So it will be when I uh, engage in this manner relationally, I feel energized. When I do my work in this pattern, I feel energized, motivated, etc. That's clear to people, and that's usually the only area that I approach with. In our discussion now, I think it's important on a bit of a deeper level, and that's what I would refer to as the energy that you bring into a room or into a context or a conversation. Energy that is unseen to you and others, but energy that is sensed and felt. And people respond to it knowingly or un unknowingly. And that's something that I really studied a lot and still do, and I see it happen. We, in, in some talents, we call it presence. Um, people bring a certain presence into it. To, to start off on the most basic area, I do see this energy and this force linked to the different domains of talent. So you have a, a, a kind of executional energy that's tied to uh, how things are done and accomplished and accomplishing energy. Then you have the so-called influencing energy. That's not such a great word for me because I feel all of us do influence in a way, but for the sake of understanding, that is a presence that comes with being seen and heard, not through what you do, but what you, what you are seen to bring from interacting with many people. Then there's the- So basically the influencing energy is about, um, I can bring something and that impacts others. Right. Whereas, whereas the execution is I do something and the doing itself is what energizes me. Correct. To put it in another way, the executional energy of different talents comes from the need for results and realities that's tangible. Mm -hmm. The influencing energy comes from the need for uh, uh, different talents that is, comes from um, response or reaction, how people respond and how I respond. That could be verbally or physically or in any of those ways. Then you get the third one is the relational force or energy that comes through personal interaction with people. And that is mostly sensed and experienced by people, mostly unknown to them, uh, but it's on a one-on-one -on -one level. It comes with a deep sense of empathy, sensing emotional interaction, supportive interaction, um, relational interaction. So and that then, would be the, the, the need for sensing, being felt. I, I, I describe it as the need for relationships and reassurance. Mm. So it's very strongly, I need to be in a relation of sorts and I need the reassurance between us, okay? Mm -hmm. Then the fourth one is your thinking domain, your thinking talents. That comes from the need for, of reason and reflection. And that also brings a force or energy with it that comes from the intellectual part, the reasoning part. Um, I, I'm fully convinced out of experience that when certain people, when people are self-aware, and comfortable in who they are, and they don't resist or suppress themselves. They, they flow, and they're confident in who they are. So there's no kind of a, there's no dysfunction um, or, or lack of, of, uh, of embracing yourself. When someone enters into a relationship or a work environment or a team, their natural talents will be felt, and will become present and would show up in a short period of time in other people's response and activities to them. So therefore, I firmly believe that when someone is very strong in thinking talents intellectually, 
when they enter a conversation, the intellectual capacity of people rise. They, they lift it without trying to. People, other people start responding by being more rational, being more uh, analytical, being more strategic, and they will up their conversation and up their interaction without even knowing that they do, and maybe not to the same level as the natural person, but they will. The same if someone with strong relational and strong empathetic talents engage with people, the empathy would rise, the emotional intelligence would rise, and people will become more sensing, more aware of emotions in the room, more tolerant of it, and, and more patient in a way with understanding emotion. So if you get someone who's strongly executional and they are involved, other will, people will respond in getting more active and more busy and more productive without really knowing what's happening to them. I, I call it, in, in team coaching, I call it that we unknowingly tap into the energy of people around us. We are influenced by people's energy or what you just described nicely with a force. So we are influenced and, and that forms kind of a synergy in a team and between people. The important thing here is that I believe this only works well and comes well where there's a, a sense of trust and a sense of awareness and a sense of respect between people, be it a family, a partnership, or a team. When there's distrust, disrespect or so, people will cut off that response, either from bringing it or receiving it. So I will, I will disrespect your energy, and therefore I won't be receptive to it. I will doubt it, and I will distrust it, and therefore it it will kind of impact me negatively. I will judge you rather than follow you. Um, and, and this is a very important part of, of forming a, a culture of mutual awareness and also in alignment in, in partnerships and relationships is it's not only what we see on paper, it's what we are opening up to to be led by someone else's talent, to let them take the lead and let me follow, okay? So something that I'm trying to uh, bring out with that, I have a, a strength model that, that I use in coaching that's got different quadrants. And the healthy quadrant lies in the flow and following area. So you flow in your strengths, and you follow in your weaknesses. What or who do you follow? The strengths of other people. So let me change my language. You flow in your force. And you follow the force of other people. If you're willing to do both, there's a healthy synergy and interaction between people. If you, mm -hmm. if you try to over, overpower people with your force to get your way, there will be a breakdown in that energy. If you resist to follow because you're, you're doubtful or hesitant or distrusting, there'll be a breakdown in the synergy. Um, so you need a, a healthy interaction always comes with two parts, flowing and following. You must be confident and vulnerable in both ends. Is this so it, 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 make, it makes a a lot of sense to me and it's actually um what, what i really like is i can i can hear and feel in what you share the experience and actually just the sentence when you said you've been watching this and you still are i i, I really believe that because it's also it's one of the things that that i am most fascinated by 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 in humans but also in groups is that that subtle layer that underlies what we can then clearly name because it's so it's so easy to or it's it can be very easy to see this is what you're really good at when you do that when you say that when you think that way but it's much more difficult to find words that describe this more energetic underpinning of there's this natural aura 
around you, which is obviously a word that will then make a lot of people cringe, but in a way yeah. that it's the reality because there is a, there is a certain quality to people that actually changes their environment. Yes. And if, if I try to put also what you just told me into, into this picture is, so for me, this is the natural life force somebody okay. has. And in me, I think we, my personal experience is we're, born, we're all born probably in my perspective with slightly different qualities of that life force. So your life force may be a tiny bit different than mine. I agree. And, and there are certain talents so ways of being, thinking, feeling in the world that are really close to my natural life force. So for me, that's really easy to, to do that in a way that's deeply connected to that kind of source in me. And I have yeah. other talents that may be much more distant to that. So, it, so for me to try to do that is really tricky because it takes a lot of energy to, to, to feed this, which is so far away from my natural expression yeah so in your words i should flow with what's close but there may be the reality that this energy down here is actually what's really natural for this person yeah so they have a, they have this natural and then actually i shouldn't try to do this myself but i should rather follow their lead and then suddenly that can become easy for me because i can actually benefit from their energy yeah. Being there, and that absolutely. can lift the whole room. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Um, one second, I'm so. Um, what you just said, <clears throat> I, I fully agree, and and yes, what I also pick up on. Um, if we look at at the different energies or forces. We can also describe it as um, awareness that we have of our consciousness. What is nice about uh, some of the descriptions in terms of talents is that you can clearly see contrasting energies. And when you observe that, you can see the contrasting energy do one of two things. Either it clashes or it aligns. And when it aligns, it forms a, a strength overall because it covers blind spots. When it clashes and people don't understand it, then, then it becomes a, a, a quite a, a, a hindrance in terms of a relationship or a partnership or working or whatever. For instance, let me, let me name a few. One, one would be the theme of connectedness and the theme of analytical. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that you could have both strong as well, which would give you an ability to, to play both ends and be comfortable with both. But in most people, it's either or. And the essence of it, that connectedness has got an intuitive sense around them that's based on a gut feel, intuition, holistic worldview. And analytical comes with a... A, a rational, fact-driven response to the world. So if you put those people next to each other in any kind of relationship and they don't have self or other awareness and don't, don't have mutual respect, they clash. Of course, the one person will do everything from a sense, connecting it, connecting the dot, but not proving it, not needing facts. The other person will want to rationalize everything and get facts behind it. And, and they really struggle to find each other. Um, you, can, you can also see that, for instance, in- Be, before, um, before we go to the second example, I, I, because this is one of the things I, I take away. These are two of the things I've taken away from, from our conversations and your, your writings the most is that um, looking at it as energy and looking at it as needs. So also that the, the analytical and the connectedness have completely different needs. Sure. The, the, the connectedness actually has the need to act from intuition and to, to connect things, whereas the analytical has the need to take things apart and to look at them individually with all yeah. the detail. Yeah, absolutely. 
And, and if people understand that it's not right or wrong, it's, it's different in its approach, but it brings value. That's when the magic happens. Um, there's, there's a certain part of science that, that always starts from the, the gut feel element, but science can't operate within that. It needs to operate within facts. So um, they, they need not go away from each other, they can embrace each other within their approach uh, towards everything, you know. If you, if you take, for instance, um, individualization and consistency, you get a different kind of clash between energies. The one being very tolerant with difference, very uh, respectful of individual needs. So individualization is is colorful, in, interested in differences, accepting of context and cultures and circumstances and loving that, loving to embrace it. Whereas consistency is black and white, procedure driven, policy driven, rules driven. And again, not right or wrong, but they, they completely clash against each other if they don't understand it. And those are forces that clash that gets expressed, you express it in how you say things and what you say, in your response to things, in your mindset, and in your emotions. And, and we need to start reading that in people and understanding how they, how they bring that in. Even in a worldview, if you take the futuristic worldview and the contextual worldview, the futuristic is fully visionary and concerned and energized with a need to explore the future. Context have a need to stay in the past and preserve what's beautiful of the past. And, and they really can, can work so well together, but also be so limiting if they use this force as a mean to overpower and not to align. Um, so the energy and the need of talents, I believe that is the, the core element of it. And in my view, especially the need, because contribution, energy is, is often seen and heard and expressed. So for people, that's a go-to. Need, on the other hand, is beneath the surface. My need to intellectualize, my need to ideate, my need to maximize. It's all under the surface. But when I start doing it and responding to it, and like me and you now, we're actually intellectualizing, ideating, etc. Yes. It's an expression it's fun, that- fun, isn't it? Yeah, people can move, <laughs> you know? And, and this is another example of why I believe me and you connect often and talk because our energies align and we have similar type of energies, not similar necessarily in opinions or worldviews. We come from different worlds. We have different beliefs and cultures and all of that. But the fact that we get energized by the process of talking and listening and formulation and analyzing and connecting, that's the force. That's the beautiful of, of, of the energy that comes with it. And what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in also in your personal experience, because I can really see what you say about the, in that place where there are different forces, um, there is a potential for either actually supporting each other in the sense of, whoa, I'm really bad at that. I, I, I will follow you, but I'm really good at this. Why don't you follow me? Um, and you called it the respect, the understanding. In your, in your experience, what's, what would you say is at the core of cultures that make that work, where actually the strengths and talents can energize each other and cultures and personal relationships where there's a fighting going on between them? What, what, what in your experience are the kind of... Uh, points where that can shift yeah i think this is this is an area where where values uh comes into play a lot as well um 
because the interesting thing is that that values and when i speak about values i speak about things that individuals or groups hold dearly and put a value in they value it enough to make it worthwhile to spend energy or decisions on and and values can also be described as energy and need a value brings with it an an energy a force that's value driven that's where war come, comes from people make war because they drive and overpower with what they seem to be valuable therefore they must push back and obtain the value for themselves whatever it is it can be a world view can be uh, you know getting into someone else's riches or whatever but he's also the need based the need for me to preserve what is valuable to me and the main major difference between values and talents is that values change and we can adopt it and let go of it you can change your values you can be convinced to change your values you can hmm. choose to change your values you can't do that with your talents your talents is a recurring pattern that actually grows stronger over your life but talents are formed and informed <clears throat> by your values and what you deemed valuable so what i see in in um in in companies and even if we want to take it broader than teams and organizations and talk about nations and political world views that we see often currently um when people get influenced from a value perspective what they value and what threatens their values that is what makes them push against or adopt something else all right and and there's an individual value but there's collective value that comes from a lot of things it can come from leadership but it can also come from history and lessons learned and culture so so people can be momentarily influenced within things or it can come through a time that it is adopted and and when things change so you <clears throat> you can see um for for instance let me use a local example of a of a national consciousness of value we what we have in in south africa so 25 years ago or so when we made the transition politically um that was because the values that the the governing minority had within our country clashed with values uh, not only local values of other people but global values all right and there was a push back in that and we know the history of it and then what <clears throat> what everybody would credit even if they liked it or not what we will credit with the one major factor that transitioned us was the leadership of one man it was the leadership of nelson mandela and he came in from a strengths perspective with a enormously strong individualized approach i firmly believe he had a very strong individualization as a talent he had a natural respect for difference he had a natural respect for individuals for opinions and he never played it off as better or worse but let's take the beauty of everything and that's where the so-called rainbow nation comes from it comes from the multitude of cultures that could align and work together and that then back became the dream of the new south africa and what some people called the miracle now that dream over time turned into a bit of a nightmare as well because uh we were strongly influenced by a leadership culture but leaders don't last and so we had new leaders and governments that came in and that was more corrupt so what then turned into a dream became a system where it became divisive again and actually where the beauty of working together became into division and separation not only driven 
internally, but driven also with a global division, a global nationalism, a global consciousness that over border started to for people to say no, but we need to protect our own and close up, etc. And we saw it in see it still in Europe, in the US, in the East, and in Africa. Okay. And that's driven from fear and need from people. So currently, we now in a situation where, where that values and that need that comes from, from a, a, a collective consciousness is actually in a lot of trouble locally. So on your question, um, people have various different talents. So I don't think that you get a a collective drive, but I do think from talents, you do get a consciousness within a, a, a culture or within a nation um, that forms values and that forms a political mindset and a political consciousness that, that politicians or leaders can then sell as either a dream or whatever, or use for the detriment for their own good, etc. But it all comes back to playing on people's emotions, playing on their energy and playing on their needs. I mean, we, we, we have it in different forms. We have it currently with the pandemic. It plays towards fear a lot. So a lot of the things that happen is fear driven um, and need driven and, and people rally and, and work around that for often their own selective selfish needs around that. So I don't know if that kind of, or did, did I stray a bit off topic now? Bring me back if I did. I, I, I do think you, you did a, you had quite a wide uh, <laughs> arch there. I do that. But um, maybe not going into the example of South Africa, because I imagine there are lots of questions about that and even questions about, about globalism, nationalism what are the advantages disadvantages of both um sure. but the 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 question i heard you or the, the the perspective i heard you say is actually if different humans with different strengths are aligned towards the same values so that we say we want that correct then it is much easier for us to accept each other's strengths and with each other's strengths also that we both might have a different path towards yeah. those values because yeah. if you are highly relational you will you will try to you will try to create relationships in which those values may be uh, realized and if i am highly actionable i will say no but the way path there is to to do these and these and these and these things. So we might have different ideas of what helps us to get towards those values, but yeah. we can still accept that we're both working towards the same values. Absolutely. So, so let's bring it back from the big thing to, to smaller teams like units, like teams or families or so. The best way that I've always found and that I use when I coach and consult teams the best way to align strengths or talents is to address values first. And, and therefore, I do a process that starts with strength, self-awareness, then other awareness of talent, and then immediately I go into values. And I assess and question if there is collective value in a team, values that hold high, that, and I'm not talking about corporate values that's on the walls, but not in the heart. I'm talking about real values that drive them. And if there's not, I challenge the team to start talking about and see what's our purpose, what drives us collectively. Because if you different, if you different talents that must align, but we have motivation to different directions, our talents won't align. We will use it to different ends. So you need to get a few collective values that you hold dear that can feed the talent, energy, and need to go there. It's extremely important. And that's even important between couples. Um, 
and families. You, you need to, in a relationship, before you can go and coach us in our relationship to align our strengths, I would go and say, but tell me about your mutual values. Why did you choose each other? And what do you both hold valuable in life? Because if you have nothing that you share in terms of this is worthwhile to spend time together, I'm not really going to help to align your strengths. You know? what's, what's that going to bring? You must have this, this joint value that you work in or alignment of it. And in, in, your, ex, in your experience, what, what are examples of values that you find because because i imagine there are there are actually not that many kind of core human values that we oftentimes all value even though we might look at them from different perspectives um so yeah. I'm, i'm curious how that plays out in teams if there are certain values that you find very often if they are very unique to each different team what's your experience with that Yeah, so um, I think when we talk about values, you, you have different types of values that you should separate and ring fence. So you should look at it, for instance, there's, there's quite a few, but you should distinguish between relational values that drives relationships and interactions, uh, social values that drives it to a broader extent out from intimacy into social interaction, material values um, that you have, productivity values that drives that kind, spiritual values even, maybe not in a team, but in families, etc. Because people will often, for values, they will say things like trust, respect, honesty. Now to me, Those are beautiful words, mm -hmm. but I go deeper. I ask them, trust in what? What do you want to trust? What? Explain to me, when will you distrust? What is it that, that aligns with it? Or respect for what? Okay. Or honesty in what? And some people will say, no, bro, just never lie to me. You know, always be honest and open. And okay, so we can go with that sense. But a value to me is, can be defined as, as, as follow, and there's many definitions for what values are. For me, values are the indicators of our behavior when we join up. It's individual as well, but in a team. When we join up to get to the mutual vision or purpose, what guides our decisions and our behavior? For me, a value If you ask me, what's the purpose of a value? And I bring it down, people will say it's behavior. It's a, to me, the most basic purpose of a value, Lucas, is decision making. When you decide what to do, you refer to a value. All of us do it. We do it consciously or unconsciously. When you decide, am I going to eat now or not, it's value driven. You know, do you value hunger or do you value ice cream or whatever? If you decide, am I going to spend this money or not? It's value driven. If you decide, am I going to spend time with my kids or am I going to work? It's value driven. If you decide, am I going to go out in the open uh, and sanitize and wear a mask or I'm going to take a risk? It's value driven. So everything we do is value driven back to decisions, which brings me to the point that collective values must be a framework to guide our contextual decisions. So that, if I take it in a family, values in a family, when I have values in my family, the purpose is not for people to be restricted in a safe space. The purpose is when the parents are not there, what will you decide to do? Value-based. What so will be for? So, My decisions are driven by my values. I don't need mom and dad to tell me what to decide if I have values. If I, if I wasn't taught values, I'll make it up as I go along and I'll form my own value system. The same for teams, the same for companies, the same for nations. 
it, it comes back to your decisions that you make. So I find this very fascinating to, to make sure that I, I, I get the values as decision indicators, basically. My, I can look at that as two ways. I can look at that as I decide by basically saying, uh, if I make this decision, it will create more of what I, of what I value. And it can also say, if I decide like this, it aligns with my value, which yeah. both are similar, but slightly different. Yeah. But basically that's the, that's the decision-making process in, in your mind is I will, I will very often make that decision based on if I do this, will that fit to what I care about? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, that's why when we align energy or force of talents, we must align it with force of values. Because if they class you in a very uncomfortable space and it's very difficult to manage yourself or people around you for the better. So if you align that and you get, let's, let's get that on the same level so that our decision-making and choices can go in a direction where there's at least some kind of an agreement in our achievement, in what we achieve. Or at times there won't be an agreement, there will be a compromise that mm -hmm. you value to be alone, I value to be amongst people, we can't have both. So let's compromise, let's go to people tonight but next weekend, we can stay home. Compromise to obtain value. It's a, simple, it's a simple example, but that's how you align them. And what I also hear from your distinction of saying there are relational values, social values, material values, it's, mm. it's actually we can look at decisions on these different layers. So yeah. does, how does this decision impact our relationship and does it bring us closer to our relationship uh, to, to the values we have there be that respect or be that truthfulness or whatever it is the same with the social are we socially truthful or respectful yeah do we do we respect the material resources we are given um yeah. so basically we can then look at it through those different lenses and see yeah. how does it how does it score <laughs> In, uh, basically based on those values. Yeah, absolutely. And there is another dynamic also, which is not something I think we should go into now because that becomes another discussion, but that is different types of value from, and this, this I, I got from Patrick Lencioni in his book, The Advantage, where you have a different types of values. You have core values, but most people push everything through the grit of core values, but that should not be done. Apart from core values, you also have aspirational values, which means it's values that's not our guide yet, but we aspire to make it so. You have permission to play values, which is more linked towards rules that if I don't respect value, I, I lose my permission to play. Um, and you have kind of uh, situational values that nobody decides on, but it just becomes the norm. And it's never thought through, but before we look, it's a culture. It's a situational kind of value. So it's also helpful when you separate those because the most important in all of these and often the most unclear is the core values because a core value is a value or values that you deem so important that you're willing to sacrifice for it. You're willing to even be limited in yourself in order to, to live out that value. That's core within you. But anyway, that's, a, that's another discussion. It, it, it is, but it... But it um, so... Number one, the, what, I, what I really like about the, the emphasis on values in this is that I find myself personally often 
very confused. I'm, I'm, there are certain contexts, and especially in the personal growth scene, I find these context, contexts quite regularly that are very um, driven by, by certain values that are not clearly defined. So there are these underlying values and it makes me often feel queasy as to what can I say and do and bring and because because I know that there is a grid and I know that my personal values don't align with that grid but I don't really know what the grid is so it it, it seems like by by really getting clear on values and by getting clear on this is what our company is working towards this is what our project is working towards we get clear on this is the grid we're moving in yeah Absolutely. And at the same time, I imagine it will always mean that because also the way I, I experience it in myself, values are usually on a polarity. So that if, if we look at it as respect and freedom, I want to be free to say whatever I think, but I also want to be respectful. The question is, which one do I value? How much, where, when? So I imagine yes. the values discussion is always also a question of what do we emphasize? Absolutely, I agree. Um, I agree. So, so it, it becomes a, for some people, when you go into this, um, it becomes too complex. Um, it becomes too, I, I, yeah, complex is the word for them to, they just want to think in terms of, yeah, let's just talk, choose values and go, that's fine. But I think for the sake of understanding the concepts in terms of helping people and teams develop and grow, you must understand your angle and what you're working with uh, when, you, when you go towards that. That's, that's really very important. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinating. I'm going to have to check out that book by Patrick, whatever his name. name. Lencioni, Patrick Lencioni, yes. The Advantage. Yeah. That's, that's good. So because what I can clearly say is see is if we have a clear grid, there will be some people who, will, who might realize, well, this is not my grid to be in. My values are different. Yeah. And then I think it's much better for them to know that and to be able to leap. You know, that's so important because most people misunderstand that any set of talents can fit into any team if, if acknowledged and used. But values, if your values don't align with a team, get out. And that's often what I tell people when they say, yeah, we need to recruit people according to talents. I say, no, 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 recruit them according to values. Talents you can use when it comes with the person and they can manage it. But if you have someone who's aligned in talent, but misaligned in values, you have problems for sure, big problems, that's, that's a given. So I cannot, and I can also see that if you align on values, then you can actually align on talents because then you can figure out how, how, how the pieces work. And sure. you can also figure out what pieces are still missing. Absolutely true, exactly. That is a fact. Which, which actually brings me to this drawing one more time of life energy, because if, if we don't know what the, what the goal is, the, the values we're moving towards, then it's really tricky also to know how to apply my, my life energy or my life or my talents, because yeah. what am I moving towards? Absolutely. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, it, it always is a... Not an either or, it's always a both and, in my view, always a both and, to look at both and, and, and to develop both. So it, it, even in, in coaching and development, you, you must give opportunity to address both and align both within, because the talents is driving the energy and motivation and need, the values that's driving the behavior in order to manage this energy. Yeah. So it seems to me like actually we're having kind of a natural closing to this discussion. And I imagine whatever we would open now would be its own 
discussion. Yeah, I, I, I want to ask you, I'm very interested in the, um, what you want to talk about children and kids and so on. But I, I do have to leave in about 20 minutes. Can can yeah. you reschedule with me for that one and we do a full a full discussion yeah. on that? Because that's definitely going to take some time. Exactly. That's my sense too. And uh, just to kind of give you an overview of what I'm interested in, that is your experience of in how far people are, are born with talents. Okay. Because in my experience, humans are landing on this planet and they bring along quite a lot. No mm -hmm. kid is like another kid. So mm -hmm. I'm curious if you would say that that applies to talents and how kids will naturally apply themselves in the world too. But I think that is a bigger discussion. Nature and nurture, that's what you refer to. Yeah, it's a small, small question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for Great. for this conversation it's always so so much fun to talk to you thank you for reaching out and and i'm, I'm pretty flexible at the moment just go to my calendar and as soon as you can let's do the the discussion i'll do that you never know what's around the next corner so.